Well, good morning. Oh, that is a little bit. Is this a little bit better? Great. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I'm super excited for today. Let me just change down my audio. That should be a little bit better coming through. Well, good morning for everyone who is joining in today. Now, I have a very, very special guest. So this is a very interesting episode and one also that I think will intrigue some of you listeners out there. Now, we're currently live on LinkedIn I love in YouTube, Twitter, but we are going to be repurposing this into a podcast. So if you do have any buzzing questions, please feel free to leave them either in the comments and we will get back to you. But apart from that, we're going to be having a nice little chat, repurposing in this into a podcast and then after a press release. Now for Rethink the Story today, one of my favorite books of all time that I actually have with me, Words That Change Minds, a phenomenal book with a international best-selling author who I'm very shortly going to be introducing. Now, Shelley Rose Carvey is a keynote speaker, trainer, consultant coach, and a worldwide, um, very well-known figure for Words That Change Minds. It's available in over 20 languages, and it was chosen recently as Forbes as one of the best management books for executives and entrepreneurs, as well as being the number one persuasion by Goodreads. Now, she's a certified speaking professional, global speaking fellow, uh, both designated multiple different awards, as well as being in the Canadian Hall of Fame. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Yeah. You are more than welcome. Yay, the book is doing well. All I can say is yay. Yeah. It's doing fantastic. One of the, the most interesting things actually is it reaches so many people. I would love for you to share a little bit more inspiration about your background. You've been in the industry for so many years and mm -hmm. how exactly the book came about to start with. Well, you know, I mean, the book it was almost an accident because I had discovered a tool called the language and behavior profile, which is not a personality profile. It's a profile of what triggers people's motivation and their productivity. And it changes by context. And I thought, this is fascinating. And it was an outshoot of neuro-linguistic programming, which I was studying and teaching at the time. I was living in France and working around Europe as a communication trainer. And I came across it, was developed originally by Roger Bailey. And I thought, wow, this is very cool. And I kept going, well, I wonder how else you can use it. Well, you can use it in recruitment because you want to match what people like to do and how they think to what's in the job and in the culture of the places they work. It's great for sales and marketing. It's amazing for coaching because it enables you very quickly with a very simple methodology to find out what's motivating people. So I kept going, well, why doesn't someone write a book about this? This is very cool. Someone should write a book about this. No one did. So I ended up writing a book about this. And this is now <laughs> the third edition, um, which we've I've been able to add in a lot of what's been done in research and brain, mind, and, and in social psychology that actually supports um, uh, the triggers that were discovered by uh, neuro-linguistic programming people. And then Roger Bailey creating this methodology. So it's been a very cool journey. Now I can imagine, and you've been touring the world, you've spoken at so many different countries. What can you say is one of the biggest aspects and continuations from having all those tools that you see over so many different countries? Well, one of the very fundamental principles that, that most people operate of, probably 70% or more, is they have a deep unconscious belief that I am like other people. So I know today we talk about all the divisions and political divisions and, you know, uh, on the pandemic that's been happening mm -hmm. and that on every other thing. But at a deeper level, people think that other people operate like they do. So, you know, if you've ever said, if I were you, I would, well, at an unconscious or maybe a conscious level, you think this would work for you, so it should work for them. And in mm -hmm. fact, that's kind of like, uh, standing at your bus stop, I want to use this bus stop analogy, and then looking down the road at those people down there at their bus stop and saying, what are you doing down there? You're supposed to be here. And then we're kind of shocked and amazed when the people we're trying to convince of something just don't get on our bus. And so when I try to teach people that if you want somebody to get on your bus, then we need to understand uh, their bus stop and actually go there and invite them on the bus by using the way they think, by talking of the language they talk, 
And then you can invite them on the bus. You can't make anybody get on your bus, but they're more likely to want to get on the bus. And then you can bring them somewhere useful for you, useful for them. Mm -hmm. If you understand what are the triggers that are going to enable somebody to get on your bus. I think it's really interesting that the way that the book is described is it takes one particular concept, but it also says about how you can apply it into a lot of different situations. So what would you say to somebody who's thought, oh my goodness, I never thought that everyone else doesn't think about me. And how exactly could you suggest for them to start opening their mind to that as well? Okay. Now, would you mind, Sabrina, can <laughs> I decode your question first and then answer it? You're more than okay, welcome. So you started uh, the question with talking about all the possible ways you could use this and ended on what if you, you had someone who, you know, just finally went, oh my goodness, people are different than me. How would you talk to them? Now, when somebody talks about possibilities, they're in what we call an options trigger. So somebody who is looking at all the possible options, but then feeling overwhelmed is in front of too many options. And what they want then is what we call a procedure. And anybody who asks a question that starts with the word how is looking for a procedure. And I suspect mm -hmm. that you're asking this question on behalf of this person over here, who needs a step-by-step -step procedure and doesn't want to be overwhelmed with options. Like, I mean, think about it. When you're learning something new, you don't want to be told there's five ways to do it. You want to, that's way too much. I don't know what this is about. What, how do you do it? So mm -hmm. if somebody asks a how question, uh, that means they're in a procedures pattern. And when someone's in a procedures pattern, they like to have a starting point, a number of logical steps to follow. And the most motivating thing is to get to the end step. So if I were going to answer that question now, the way not to answer it would be to do, well, you could do this or you could do that, or there is another possibility. If you do that, the person that needs the how is now even sunk deeper in too many options and they're in overwhelm. But if you want to answer the question the way they asked it in a way that is going to enable them to get on the bus, mm -hmm. you're talking the procedure, which means first, the thing to know is what is your goal? Like, what is it that you want to achieve in a particular communication situation? Part step two, who do I have to communicate? What's important to them as well as what's my message? And then step three, follow the uh, language and behavior or the words that change one's methodology so that you can have a result. So the last step is getting results. One, step two, step three. So you can answer that question two ways, but only one of those ways is really an answer for the other person. No, it's so true. And you can tell straight away when you've got their attention, otherwise you lose it very, very quickly. And another part that you speak about is being able to capture that attention without losing it. And, and how important is that in terms of creating that instant, uh, keeping the attention of somebody while you're having a conversation and you're trying to figure out where exactly they are in the journey and when, what's coming across from their particular perception too. Yeah, well, I'd like to offer a procedure. <laughs> and then you can say, yeah, but isn't there any other way you could do it? And then in that case, I would give you some options. So one of the nice things about this methodology is it gives you some questions to ask that help you find out what are the different patterns. Now, we've talked about one continuum between options and procedures. Uh, I hope you hear now I'm going into another option here. And the series of questions can help you find out the best way to uh um, uh, to, to phrase what it is you want to phrase. So one question would be, you know, a person is talking about something and you might say, well, why is that important to you? Mm -hmm. And that'll help you find out a couple of things that will enable you to know what to do to keep their interest. So a person will say, well, I'm interested in blah, blah, blah. Oh, well, why is that of interest to you? Or why is that important to you? Now they're going to answer in one of two ways, according to the words that change minds model. Either they're going to talk about the benefits of getting that, what they will gain, or they're going to talk about, well, what might happen if they don't get it and what's been going wrong that they want to fix. And mm -hmm. these are two patterns called toward and away from. So in the first one, the person is moving towards a goal and a benefit. And in the second one, the person is trying to get away from or solve or fix or prevent a problem or an issue that they don't want to have. Like, for example, uh, hardly anybody goes to see a doctor because uh, they have a goal for their health. They usually go to see the doctor because they're not feeling well and they want to get rid of that feeling. And then you go to the doctor and the doctor hardly ever says, well, what are your goals for your health? No, they say, tell me what's wrong. 
And that's they the did, they and it's solvent. So that's like a clear example of uh, toward and away from. Amazing. And, and towards and away, you explained it so, so nicely in the book on how exactly you can frame it in different situations. And I'd love to bring this more into a, a sales pitch kind of way. So when you're on the phone to someone, I, I really don't believe in selling. I believe in the art of inception where you find out what they want, see if you can help, and then you're able to bridge the gap. And how exactly do you use this in framing your words in figuring out, okay, what are they looking for and how, or what are they looking to escape? Um, and how do you change your tonality to fix that as well? Right, right. Tonality is also important. And, you know, um, I, I want to back up one step. One of the things I talk about in the book that is, I, I suggest people write this down because it's going to help you enormously. <laughs> is the power principles. And there's two power principles, mm -hmm. and, I, and particularly in a business context, and specifically in a sales or marketing context. And it's about getting interest, people's interest as well, and keeping a great rapport and credibility with them. And the power principles, number one, everything you do affects the emotional state of your customer. How you look at them, how you smile, how you respond to what they say, your tone of voice, everything. And we know that uh, when the way people respond to us when we phone for a service or we're interested in something either puts us, gets us more excited or puts us off. So mm -hmm. people have this power and they're not aware of it. The second power principle is that everything you do determines, it's a pretty strong word, what your customer thinks of your whole organization. So they don't even think of you as you. They think of you of what you represent. If you work for a company, you are the company to them. How you behave is really important. So if in sales, you really want to help your customer buy, which I think, as you said, is a much better perspective than trying to get somebody to do something, it's important to know whether they're trying to solve a problem or fix it, or if they have a goal. And so if they have a goal in, in, in the buying process, you can say, well, this product or service has these advantages and these benefits. Now, it's helpful if you know what they're looking for so that you can frame how this product meets their needs, uh, mm -hmm. if it does, of course. Or if they've answered the question, why is that important to you or why is that important to you now? By saying, well, we've had this issue and it can't go on anymore. Then you frame your product or service as a means of preventing or solving the problem. And it means you use what we call influencing language that's either toward or away from. So uh, an example of toward would be, well, our coaching service enables you to, to get to your goals more easily and then enjoy what it is you're doing. Well, it turns out that most people who seek a coach do not have a toward motivation. They have a problem that they need to get fixed or they have a, a goal that they're stuck on. They don't know how to get there. And if you mm -hmm. use only toward language in the buying process, it never becomes urgent enough for them to act now. You know, like you look at your email in the morning and the things that go help or you screwed this up. Those are the things you, you tend to answer. <laughs> <to my list. laughs> yeah, problems are a priority. So in that case, it would be really helpful to talk about uh, symptoms and how this is going to get rid of those symptoms. So if you've been feeling like you didn't have a purpose and you're not sure what you're going to do, well, our coaching process can help you get rid of that lack of clarity and all the uncertainty and the uncertainty in your life so that, and then you can move toward, you can become more this, more that. And uh, so you start with the bus stop where the person's at. And if it's more of a, how do I get rid of this problem? How do I fix this? And start with that. And you know, most coaches, we're trained to ask goal-oriented questions. Well, the thing that drives people to see us is they have an issue. They're mm -hmm. stuck, right? On something. No, it's, it's so interesting how you say it because it's so many different industries. And I know a lot of your experience has actually been going in and, and fixing the process from the start and figuring out what are those triggers. How have you taken that, not just from the sales call, but you've also brought it into other companies and their marketing and their copy. And I've seen some amazing examples that you've created for ads showing uh, how the different copy having them towards something against them has actually then framed the rest of the call as well. Uh, absolutely. And uh, I'm getting to do some very interesting work with uh, some uh, larger companies and medium sized companies mm -hmm. as well. 
that, that everybody realizes that it's not a simple decision how customers or clients or members, depending on the kind of organization you do, decide to become customers. So I've yes. taken a wealth management company and I've interviewed uh, people who phoned and wanted to become customers. And there was two groups, one group who phoned but didn't become customers and one group who phoned and did sign on with this mutual fund company. And so we looked at what are the below conscious pattern differences? Well, so that was one kind of research for larger companies. I've also tracked the buying process that their customers go through. So their ideal customers, their target market, and, and they're usually defined in with uh, uh, demographics and some behavioral things. And what I like to do is then take that information and decode it mm. into the language and behavior, motivation and productivity patterns, which means like what's driving it underneath. And so the kind of research I'm doing now is identifying the buying path, which means that as a company, uh, you can figure out very easily what language to use, and I help companies actually do this and language things, at what step in the buying process. And of course, a buying process is a procedure. And uh, one of the big mistakes that creative people and companies make is this options thing about here, let's have lots of options. Well, for most people when they're buying, there is an options phase in which they look at what's out there but they never buy at the options phase. They, When they decide to go ahead and commit, they switch back into a more procedures phase. And if you haven't realized when that switch happens, you may not notice the buying signals. So it, is, it really is important to pay attention to this stuff. And, and another pattern, oh, options alert, that people need to pay attention to when you're, when you're accompanying people, does, does your client want familiarity? They want something they already know. We call that sameness. Do they want mm -hmm. progression? Do they want to feel that they're evolving or that the service is evolving and changing in a very uh, progressive way? Or do they want something that's totally new? Like the diet industry, people only have a short period of time in which they're willing to follow a diet and then they want to try something new. It's not that the first one necessarily worked and they want to move on to something else, but doing the same thing over and over again, a lot of people in that context, you just keep looking for something new. So it's useful to find out in your target market, what are the specific triggers uh, in the different phases of the buying uh, the buying process. And that's why I prefer to talk about the buying process and selling someone because <laughs> you aren't the person making the decision, it's them, right? No, it's so true. And I, I think it's a book actually I wish I read five years ago because a lot of the concepts I'm thinking, yes, that's that's really how I've changed. So if you had, if you uh, was listening and, and someone else what could be some steps now that they could easily implement to really start thinking about how they can take what you've said in terms of the, the theory, but also the examples in your book and start really looking at their own buying model and their business as well? Well, okay. So you kind of asked an option and a procedure -y question. So what are some of the steps, <laughs> options? But, but let's, go to, let's go to the how. And just as a little hint, you know, tiny nuances in language attract different groups of people. So uh, if you tell someone, well, that's a way to do it, that's options because it presupposes if there's a way or one way, there's got to be others. Whereas if you tell someone that's the way to do it, then it presupposes there's one right way. And when you're in a procedural mode, you only want to have one right way, right? And these are the people right. who say, well, we can't let you do it because then we'd have to let everybody else do it. Like there's one procedure for everyone. So what I would suggest you do is think about who is your market. I've got my hands not on the screen. <laughs> Who's in your market and what's important to them? And then take the list of patterns and go through, well, that's like what? Okay, so then do experiments. Like if you're, uh, if you're writing articles online, if you're doing ads online, easy to experiment. So try the language for the one or two patterns that you think really matter and see what happens. Interview people, see what happens. The questions in the mm -hmm. lab profile are very, very helpful. Just ask the questions and listen to the answers and, and you'll see how to decode them. Now you probably already know, everybody that's listening probably already knows how to decode toward and away from, right? It's either I want this or I gotta get away from this. And options and procedures, like what else is there? 
or how do you do this? And I'm reminded of this hilarious Jerry Seinfeld joke who said, what's the difference between how, this is Jerry Seinfeld, not me, but I love this joke. <laughs> what's the difference between how men and women watch television? And he said, women want to know what's on television and men want to know what else is on television. That's options and procedures. You know, if you want to get to the end of the story and not be jumping around, that's a procedure, right? Stories are procedures. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm, and I, I love the fact that you're able to to explain it with such clarity in your book as well. The the examples that you gave, the the TV example as well. Another massive part of your life is speaking on stage, and you're a very captivating keynote speaker. You can tell the story. You're very clever with the way that you say words that allows the audience to feel that, in a sense, they don't need to listen to you. But if they do listen to you, then they may or may not learn X kind of outcomes. And what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's going onto stage who can really utilize the words that they're saying in order to captivate that audience as well? You know, I, I've taken a lot of coaching over the years. Every year I get input and feedback to help me be mm -hmm. a better speaker and an entertainer. And, you know, I think deep down, I just want to be an entertainer. And I'm very <laughs> lucky. I have content. It's not just fluff. So I'm, I'm delighted about that. But if you want just fluff, I do have a little piece of uh, a stand-up comedy on my YouTube channel. Just check Shelly Rose Sharva YouTube channel. It's called The Sex Life of Dragonflies. You can just Google that. It was my attempt at, uh, my most recent attempt at stand-up comedy. <laughs> it's not X-rated, although it does talk about sex. So there you go. You're going to have a, have a look at that. Uh, but one of the people who really influenced how I speak is a, a speaker who's passed away, Warren Evans. And one of the things he said, and I think this is useful for anybody that makes a presentation anywhere. And he said, only an amateur warms up on stage. So you know how you start a presentation, you go, well, after a little while, I felt good. Well, that's an amateur. No, you warm up beforehand. You get ready for your audience. You go out there. And then my piece of advice that I would, uh, that I would add is there's two things you need to do with your audience. Establish credibility and rapport. Mm -hmm. If you have a skeptical audience, and that's actually one of my best-selling MP3s. It's called Presenting Ideas to Skeptical People. Um, it's available on wordsthatchangeminds.com, presenting ideas to skeptical people. If you have skeptics in your audience, they need you to be credible. And if you have people that are really happy to be there and enthusiastic, they're more interested in rapport. So you've got to do both. But if you've got skeptics in your audience, start with them. Because if you don't get them on board, then they're going to kind of make it a bit nasty for everyone else. And believe me, there are more skeptics today than there ever were. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. If you're a woman presenter, you still have to establish your credibility. If you're a, a man, usually you're assumed to be credible and, and you can screw it up by saying ridiculous things. But women generally today still have to establish credibility. And so that, that's an important thing to know how to do. So look like you know what you're talking about. And then the language piece of that is to offer people information and invite them to decide. If you make bold statements, that's great. But if everybody thinks, how the hell, how the hell do you know that? Or why do you think that's mm -hmm. true? Or don't tell me what to do. So you don't want to engage the defensive reaction by necessarily punching people in the face with your ideas. But offer them information and see what they think. Now, I'm not telling you what to do because, of course, only you can decide whether that makes sense or not for you. See, that would be an example. No, it, it makes me smile as well. The, the way that you present it and it comes across, it's very endearing, it's very inviting, but it's also really interesting how you say the perception of a, a female and male is very different on stage. And what do you think in particular drives that? And how do you create that instant credibility as soon as you go on as well? Well, I think what drives it is tradition. I mean, the research is still showing today that when you say the word leader, white man comes to many people's minds, even if we're not white or we're not a man. So it's kind of there in the background. So personally, I think everyone needs to think about their credibility and their rapport when they're mm -hmm. making a presentation at work and when they're on the stage. We all need to think about it. If your purpose, okay, toward language alert is to get a message across and you want to avoid screwing it up, then it may be in your best interest to learn how to be more credible uh, and have more rapport. And then there's another belief that I choose to hold. 
is even if people don't look like this belief is I choose to hold the belief that everybody deep down inside wants to have fun and laugh. So holding this belief helps me do that. No, I love it. And and you're quite a stand-up comedian, I would say, not just on um, your Dragonfly YouTube, but also you bring that out very easily when you speak. And it also gives you that elevated level of confidence. And how impactful do you think the humor and the lightheartedness and fun and kid-like child inside of you actually elevates that credibility and um, confidence? Well, I make well. fun of myself. And people think, well, <laughs> she's got to be credible if she makes fun of herself, right? So maybe that's part of it. And I also have this face, which I think by itself is just a funny face. And then, of course, I exaggerate the heck out of it. So there you go. That makes life more fun. <laughs> no, I love it. And, and one kind of final touch I'd love to talk about is how exactly can you use your book towards dating and relationships? There's so many, um, I think, fun words in an inception and creates uh, to create sales cycles, to strengthen teams. But how do we bring it into our love life? Well, you know, I was giving this uh, presentation uh, in Vancouver to a group of financial planners, and I was talking to them about the these patterns called internal and external. Internal mm -hmm. or Sometimes skeptical people have this pattern. I want to decide for myself. Don't tell me what to do. I, based on my values and what's important to me, what's internal to me, I'm going to decide. And then, of course, on the continuum is towards external, which is, you think that was okay? Where you want feedback and guidance and input. And, of course, if someone's very, very internal, they're hard to influence. Um, they may be a bit rigid at the extreme, but if they're internal, they decide for themselves and you can't tell them what to do. If they're external, they look for external uh, either feedback, but it means they're more flexible. So if somebody gets a bad reaction, they're more likely to change their behavior than someone who says, oh, they just didn't understand. Well, let's take this to dating. So I'm on this stage uh, describing internal versus external clients. And then it suddenly occurs to me that you could do this in your profile because the language for internals is this invite to decide. Here's an idea. So how are you going to know if I'm the right person for you? Well, there's only one way to find out. Ooh, so I like that's it. for internals, right? But <laughs> external people, you can offer statistics. Four out of five dentists said I was a good date. I don't know, whatever. You know, <laughs> you can offer statistics. Well, maybe that's a way you could, uh, you know, up your profile uh, or uh, finding a partner. No, I can imagine. Um, and bringing it into the, the dating world could be a lot of fun. Now, yeah, if you want somebody who wants to explore options or somebody who has their standard routine, of course, we could apply that to sex too, couldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> well, that could definitely be an interesting conversation. Yeah. Uh, we'll leave that one for the dragonflies today, though, I think. Right. <laughs> um, no, I would love also to hear about what you're working on because the more I, I deep dived into a lot of your projects, you're, you're building apps, you're finding about how to utilize technology to understand even from emails about if someone's internal and external. So I'd love to hear a few of your upcoming projects and how exactly right. you're using your words to um, create change there as well. Right. So well, there's a lot of things going on. Maybe I have an options in a difference pattern. Who knows this? But uh, one uh, early uh, app that we uh, developed that's still available, it's a, and we've upgraded it a few times. So <laughs> it's available both on iOS and uh, Android for free. And uh, you may or may not like the title. The title is called Husband Motivator. So if you search Husband Motivator, all one word, or even just go to husbandmotivator.com, it'll give you the links to Android and iOS. And this is an app that enables you to find out what's motivating your husband, let's say, or your wife or anybody else. We just designed it for people with husbands and then gives you a four-step methodology that I call the four-step motivation methodology. Mm -hmm. Only in the app, it gets customized to the person you're talking about in the context. So you can use it many times. So there's a lot of different contexts in your life. You choose a context, answer some questions about the other person, your husband, and then it gives you a four-part script, a four-step motivation method, and you can use that. So that's one of our apps. It's totally free. Amazing. I invite you to download <laughs> it and use it. Um, also for boyfriends and, and relationships. Boyfriends as well. There we go. Boyfriend, your boss or your mother or whoever <laughs> else. You just imagine instead of putting in their name, you put in your mother's name or whatever. 
And then uh, a, a much uh, longer project is we have developed now patented software called Libretta that enables you to click on a button and when you receive an email, the analysis of the email comes up and it shows you or guides you, gives you suggestions because we wouldn't want to tell you what to do on how to answer. And then you answer and you click Libretta again and it evaluates your answer against the incoming email, mm. not in terms of content, but in terms of these language barriers and gives you a fit score and shows you how to improve your uh, email if it needs improving. Anything over 50% is good to go. So you can get it at uh, libretta.com uh, and you can also try it out at libretta.com. There's a place where you can stick in a text. Maybe you want to understand what's motivating your boss or, mm -hmm. or a, a client that you'd like to work with and uh, put in your email and it'll send you an analysis of what are the patterns that are scientifically operative, dominant in that text. So it's not a personality thing. It's about what was motivating that person um, when they wrote you. And it measures six different patterns toward and away from uh, internal and external and options and procedures, which is more than enough to find out, to be able to get, uh, to take that email uh, and know how to respond so that you avoid, there's my away from language, so you avoid getting a negative response and you're more likely to get a positive response back. And try it out for free. It's available on a subscription basis and I use it 20 times a day and I'm the queen of this material. No, it's, it's amazing how you've been able to really integrate the, the technology. And I've, I've tried it myself. It's very clever. So anybody who is, even I would say teams should really adopt it because it's not just about creating that outcome, but it's also about building those relationships. So I have it to really it is. Well. It really is. But now, you know, so we're marketing this tool and we have to think about what is the motivation that would make somebody want a tool? Well, you may think it's because you want to have a positive response, but really what motivates people to buy the tool, I think, and I, it's not everybody, of course there's differences, mm -hmm. is that they don't want to take a risk on certain emails. You know, you everybody gets emails where you go, oh, I better think about this before I answer, right? And then that's what this is for. So I kind of think it's an away from product. It prevents problems from happening. No, for sure. I, my mindset is is very towards, but I'm glad you brought the away from because I can imagine it being uh, fairly created to that. Um, Thank you, everybody, for your comments. I love seeing them come <laughs> up. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Like, I'd love to answer some. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Um, let me have a little look as well. I can cut through to this. So the other part of one question um, that we have come up is how exactly can teams implement this methodology? Um, that's the question. Um, it was a how question, right? It was I'm a how question. Thinking. It was a how question. Because of course my first temptation was, you no, but I'm not gonna do that. All right. <laughs> um, what, one of the challenges for teams is uh, how it, particularly now that some people are at work, some people are remote, uh, et cetera, is how to work effectively together. And in 2021, and I suspect also in 2022, uh, a lot of teams have had to learn how to work differently. And there's been no support, no nothing for mm -hmm. teams. And um, leaders are struggling. They have bigger teams than before. And it, it, it's, it's more complex. And now we're all using more complex technologies. I don't know about you, but half the time I'm trying to get something done. And <laughs> the technology says, well, you can't do that. You have to do this first. And then you go try to do that and says, no, no, you can't do that. You have to do this first. And you're five steps behind. It's more complex today. And then there's the human element. Like we're all remote. Like, did you, didn't you tell me you were going to do this? How aren't we supposed to be like, what's going on? And I think one of, uh, oops, I was going to say one of the ways, <clears throat> erase, 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 how the lab profile can help you is by using it to understand the job that our team is doing, like what is important here? How are we going to do it? How will we know when it's done effectively? Those kind of questions can really clarify what are the responsibilities of a team? then you can figure out who would be the best to do what and how to coordinate things. 
In the second half of the profile, in the productivity patterns, we look at uh, some of the issues, some of the patterns that make productivity uh, better or worse. And there's three main productivity patterns. One is, I want to be alone. I want to be alone. Where if I am with other people, I can't think it disturbs my concentration. The second one is, uh, that's called independent. The second one is mm-hmm. proximity, in which I need to be with other people. So like, we are kind of together. You're asking me questions, I'm answering. We have very specific roles, but I'm much more articulate when I'm talking to someone than when I'm all by myself, just talking to myself. It's all, it's, it's, this is a proximity activity. And then there's the, let's all be together synergy pattern where we're all cooperatively working together. Well, it's very important to look at what are the tasks that need to be done and which, what, like, what do the people need? Like if you're writing code, you don't want to do it in a room full of people that are all talking. You need to be able to concentrate and you want to hire people who have that as a productivity pattern and that kind of thing. So the lab profile can actually help you figure out who should be doing what job and also who do you need to hire to do that job. Mm, and it's, it's really interesting, actually, the leadership aspect and the, the teamwork aspect there that allows you to think in other people's shoes. What are What's their reality, the way that they see things and, and creating that communication. So I love that one. Yeah, and um, I, I think uh, a good idea for managers is to take them through, take their, their team through a profile, like to actually mm-hmm. ask the questions. And I have a resource for people. If you're interested, if you go to wordsatchangeminds.com and click on test your influence, you can get your own lab profile in your work. So it'll, you'll send you a report. It'll, it's about uh, the language and behavior profile in the context of communicating at work. And you'll find out all your patterns and some suggestions of how to improve your communication. <laughs> I did that last night, actually. I, d- I was a, a very um, proactive uh, person. And I would agree with some of the, the suggestions it said. It was really interesting to hear back. And okay, then I well, the yes, top. if you want feedback, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's really very interesting. And I have one more if you have time as well. Um, your favorite way to introduce yourself when you're meeting somebody for the first time at a networking event? Oh, thanks, Imran Terry. Thanks for that question. <laughs> um, my favorite way. Now, see, that's an options question because favorite way presumes that there are many ways, right? So I just wanted to point that out. So I will answer the options question with an option. Well, uh, one way I like to do it is to quickly introduce my stand-up comedy, The Sex Slice of Dragonflies. Why? Because it's funny. But then again, of course, sometimes I need to have credibility. And I talk about my book and the fact that it's out in many different languages. So those are a couple different options. But I'd rather the funny option. Amazing. What I'll do in, as well as in the show notes for anyone who'd like to listen after is I will link both the video but also your book so we can have a little bit of humor there um, as well as how to find more. And on that note as well, what is the best way that somebody connect with you um, if they're intrigued and they're curious to potentially learn a little bit more about the book, where are the best place to purchase and hopefully leave a review as well? Uh, Words That Change Minds is available on Amazon. If you want to know about training courses, we have online trainings that are shorter or longer. Uh, For leaders, I have an in-depth course called Advanced Business Influence. And uh, all of that is available on wordsthatchangeminds.com. For consultants, coaches, and trainers, uh, we take people through the, the introduction, the practitioner program, and then we offer a consultant, trainer, coach certification so that you can offer this material in your work. Either we have marketing consultants, coaches, and trainers of all kinds who come onto the program. Oh, I love it. Thank you. And your final question of today, um, what are you? which book are you currently reading? I am currently reading Iris Murdoch, a murder mystery from <laughs> the 50s, which is, uh, yeah, it's just, a, it, it was recommended by the New York Times, uh, Uh, And that's what I was I'm reading right now is a murder mystery. But last summer, um, I read a great book, and I think it's very, very timely that I'd like to recommend uh, by Thomas King, who is a novelist. Uh, He's a Native American and lives in Canada now. And he wrote a very interesting book about pre-European history in North America called The Inconvenient Indian. And it really 
illustrates, uh, and he has a great sense of humor. Like he starts off his book by saying, uh, his, my wife told me not to start at 1492 when uh, uh, Columbus <laughs> came over. And then the next paragraph says, in 1492, and he goes down that route. Amazing. And then he realizes that his wife was right and he has to start somewhere else. But it, it's a wonderful conversational history of what actually happened. Who was here in North America before? What were they doing? What was it like? And, and in the whole Niagara Hamilton area where I live, it was kind of like the uh, a European Union of Nations. There was a lot of wars, but it's very interesting, all these different cultures and nations. And then what happened as the Europeans came? And it's a very different perspective. And as a history book, it read like a story. And I highly recommend that to people. So I was reading that last summer and I couldn't stop talking about it. Oh, I appreciate that, Chef. Thank you. Being an Indian by Thomas King. <laughs> I love it. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, for anyone who has enjoyed today, I would highly recommend Words That Change Minds by Shelley Rose Covey. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on here. And I hope you have an incredible rest of your day in Mexico. Well, Sabrina, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you so much.